second, I want to turn the fan down. I can hardly hear myself with that roaring next to me here. Let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We're in the book of Proverbs, a very important book for rulers, a very important book for those who would develop character quality that pleases God, because character does, in fact, matter. Proverbs chapter 29, the passage that we're looking at today, in verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us wisdom and insight into this verse. A verse that has great implications for our country all the time, but particularly at this season as we move towards some critical elections here in this land. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand what your standards are for those who would be in positions of authority, particularly in a nation, and, Father, that you would help us to be a discerning people so that we base our judgments not on popularity, not upon whether or not we think a certain candidate has a likelier chance of winning than another candidate. But, Father, based upon your word, for your word is true. It tells us what the outcome will be when different types of people are elected. It tells us what the outcome will be when we have certain kinds of rulers and leaders, whether at the federal level or the state level, the county level or the municipal level. In every sphere of authority in life, it gives us a description of what is necessary to be pleasing to you for those who are in positions of authority. And so, Father, we pray for the going forth of your word this day, as we have prayed before, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you've noticed, obviously, our text for today is very short, but I think it's a very appropriate text for the times in which we live. It's a text that deals with people who are truly free versus a people who are under the oppression of the wicked. And there have been many rulers and leaders in the world, and some are here in the United States, who would oppress God's people. It is a key verse that helps us understand what it takes for governmental stability, for governmental integrity, for governmental effectiveness, for governmental justice, for governmental efficiency, for governmental simplicity versus bureaucracy, for governmental openness versus opaqueness in government, for governmental accountability, for governmental impact on the citizens of a country, all in all for good government from a divine perspective. It's all contained in this one tiny little verse. In short, the issue before us in relation to government is righteousness versus wickedness. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Conformity to God's revealed standards is the issue of righteousness versus rebellion against God's standards, which is wickedness. Listen to another verse in Proverbs. Proverbs 28, 15. As a roaring lion and a ranging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. They're described as roaring lions, those wicked rulers. They're fearsome, dangerous, deadly, powerful, and loud like roaring lions. You know, Jesus is the regal lion of the tribe of Judah, but Satan is a roaring lion, just like the wicked ruler. 
1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And then we're told to resist him steadfast in the faith. Well, if that is true for Satan, who's described as a roaring lion, it is likewise true resisting steadfast in the faith those who are wicked rulers and who are as roaring lions as well. People, we cannot simply sit by and put our hands in our pockets and wait and see what happens. We are to resist the roaring lions. And the wicked rulers are described precisely the same way as Satan is described in 1 Peter 5.8. Those who crucified Christ are also described in the same way. The book of Psalms gives to us an incredible prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, and particularly in Psalm 22, concerning his death upon Calvary's cross. And here is how it describes those who surrounded him at the cross and were gaping on him and laughing at him and mocking him and scorning him in Psalm 22:13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. That's the picture that is given to us of the wicked. Satan, the father of the wicked, and then those who are wicked who follow in his steps. Those wicked rulers who put Jesus to death. Those who are wicked rulers who oppress the people of the land. That is how scripture describes them. Righteous government will always cause God's people to rejoice. Wicked government will always cause God's people to mourn. Not merely, and this sometimes happens when we're walking in the flesh, but not merely because it cramps their own personal lifestyle, although wicked rulers will cramp your personal lifestyle, but they mourn because it fails to fulfill its obligation, that government, that wicked government, it fulfills or it fails to fulfill its obligation to mirror the heavenly government of God himself. Believers look at government through the divine lenses if they should look at it at all. The verse here is talking about God's people, those who mourn when the wicked are in authority, because these are the people that see things from the divine perspective. Sometimes even the people of God become carnal, however, and they fall into sin, and they rejoice in the wicked rather than the righteous because the wicked are passing laws, the wicked are administering laws, the wicked are acting judicially with the law in a way that pleases them personally, even though it is not in harmony with the standards that God has set forth in his word. In Proverbs, Solomon is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as you read Proverbs, you find him reading or, or writing from the perspective of a godly husband, the perspective of a godly father, the perspective of a godly king, the perspective of a godly leader. Now Solomon himself obviously fell very far short in his own personal life, but what he writes is wisdom from God. This is the divine perspective as we look at this verse here in the book of Proverbs. The verse gives us the test by which we as Christians are to test government, wherever you find it. And it's not a matter of opinion. It is a matter of the divine standards that God has established for government, because government is one of the spheres of authority that God has ordained. And so God has given to government its limits, its boundaries, and its obligations. God has declared what government's character is supposed to be. God has declared what makes a good ruler and what makes a bad ruler. And so it is not a matter of our opinion. It is a matter of comparing what there is or what might be with the standards that God has set forth in his word, which is, for the believer, the final authority. It's not merely a matter of opinion. When government, for whatever reason, fails to conform to the divine standards, you have bad government. When it conforms to the divine standards in all three of its branches, as we have it here in the United States, then it is good government. In an election year, these tests should be applied to all candidates for office, federal, state, county, and municipal. The question then becomes, how do we test government by scripture? 
Well, of course, one of the best places to start is in Proverbs. Solomon, who was a ruler, understood the grinding machinations of government. He understood slothful bureaucrats. He understood political intrigue. He understood the balance of international power and was quite competent as he balanced power between the Hittites to the north and the Egyptians to the south. Solomon understood all the same principles by which good government today must rule over its people. Let me give you the first insight from the mind of God through Solomon to us. It's the opening seven verses of the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. That's how he identifies himself. That's how he's going to approach this book. That's where he's going to give wisdom because he wants to train his sons for leadership. There are many other things in many other spheres of life that are contained in the book of Proverbs. But he's writing as king. Son, do you want to be a wise ruler? Do you want to be a leader? Rehoboam turned out not to learn these lessons very well. He was a fool. But Solomon is writing as the king, giving wisdom so that those who follow him would be able to also exercise authority properly. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Oh, those four things. We could spend the entire message just talking about those four things there, and how lacking it is in our political sphere today to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. These are those who are coming up. These are those who are designed for leadership in the future. These are those who will take over after we die, folks. Same thing that Paul said to Timothy, the things that thou hast heard, among, uh, heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We will not be around forever. Oh, in heaven, yes. But here on earth, no. If we do not pass it on to the next generation, the next generation will be a generation of fools. Much was not passed on to the current generation. And we see the balance tipping from wisdom to folly in every sphere of authority, not merely government, but in the church, in the home, at work, Oh, how sad it is when fools reign. Moving on. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation. The words of the wise and their dark sayings. And now he gives us the foundation stone. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon opens the book of Proverbs, this instruction book, with a clear statement of the foundation that underlies everything. That foundation is wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is the equivalent of saving faith and the godly lifestyle. Many years ago, I was trying to figure it up in my head as I was sitting here on the platform a few minutes ago. It's at least 43 or 44 years ago. I did a study of every place that phrase shows up in Scripture. And it is always tied to one of those two things. Either saving faith or the godly lifestyle. That's the way that it always appears, the fear of the Lord. In these first seven verses, Solomon tells us something that a ruler needs to know. Solomon speaking as a king, a secular ruler, a secular leader. He declares that wisdom, instruction, and understanding are foundational. If you don't have that, you cannot build a house that will stand. You all know the, the story of the wise man and the foolish man who built their houses respectively on sand and on rock. And the one falls when the wind and the rain and the storm comes and the other stands firm. The foundation upon which we not only must build our personal lives, and much of Proverbs deals with the personal life, because that's what then enables you to have a solid public life. 
But this truth also applies to national entities as well. He states the four purposes of learning this book. It's to produce wisdom and judgment and justice and equity. You know, when we're talking about law and equity, our, our country used to have two separate kinds of courts. We had equity courts, such as the Court of Chancery, and we had law courts. Equity and law go back to the two different types of courts that were in Great Britain, where the common law was developed. All the states, except the state of Louisiana, have a common law tradition. Louisiana has the French Napoleonic Code tradition, which is if, if a particular issue comes before the court and there is not some particular pigeonhole into which you can stick that problem, it's thrown out. There has to be a specific law to deal with it. But in England, under the Protestant Reformation, we find a development of two court systems, one controlled by the, by the church and one controlled by the king's bench, queen's bench now. And all the legal issues went before king's bench and the equity questions went before the clergy, all the way up to the days of Thomas More. And you know it's very interesting because as you look at this division, the law was just sort of like that French Napoleonic Code, but equity could deal with questions where wisdom was required to make a judgment that would be what we would call equitable. That's why they called them courts of equity. It's not really the same thing as fairness, but it's whereby a just decision can be arrived at even if there is not a specific law that deals with the issue. The book of Proverbs is designed to help you so that if there is not some specific guideline, let me give you a modern illustration, like thou shalt not smoke. You don't find that in the Bible. But should you as a believer smoke? No. Equity would help you to understand why not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit if you are a believer. If you defile the temple of God, God will destroy you. You have a testimony to young people. There are many different things that you could put in relation to this, but it doesn't have to have a specific command. Only legalists require a specific command for or a specific command against. Equity is the ability to understand with wisdom how God's law applies to specific things where he hasn't given you a list of rules. Do we need leaders in our government who understand these four principles? Yes, we certainly do. Solomon says here that learning Proverbs will enable you to make subtle distinctions when the questions are hard, to give subtlety to the simple. You know, the, the shades of gray that people always want to drag you through so that they can get to the point whereby they can, they can approve their own sin. To give subtlety to the simple. He says that if you learn Proverbs, you will have discretion. You will be discreet in your decision-making process. He tells us the wise man will listen, but the fool will reject the wisdom that God has set out in Proverbs. That's foundational. Solomon the king is going to tell you what it takes to be a good ruler. Solomon the king is going to tell you from God's perspective, even though he himself failed on many occasions, as will we, what God expects and requires of those who are in positions of leadership. So when we're looking at the political candidates that we have running for office, coming up not too long from now, we ask three questions based on this introductory material in the book of Proverbs. Number one, do they have the fear of the Lord? That is, from God's perspective, in our terminology, are they saved and do they live a godly lifestyle? Number two, do they make scripture their final touchstone for governmental standards? Boy, you find very few and far between that are like that. And number three, are they wise? Not are they powerful, 
Not are they politically astute so they know how to manipulate and how to lie at the right time to the right set of people so they get their votes and then turn around and lie to a different set of people so they get their votes. That's not wisdom. That's just being politically astute. Avoiding saying certain things in front of one crowd and emphasizing those things in front of another crowd. That's not wisdom, that's political astuteness. The question is, are they wise? And we're talking about wisdom from God's perspective. We're not talking about worldly wisdom, which Paul talks about over 1 Corinthians. We're talking about godly wisdom. Whereby they take the scriptures and apply it to the situation and come up with a right answer from God's perspective to whatever question is thrown at them by the audience. Are they wise? If you don't see any of those things, that means one of three things. You look at the candidate and you say, man, I, I don't see any that have the fear of the Lord, salvation, or godly lifestyle. I don't see any that are making the scripture their final touchstone for governmental standards. Or when they refer to scripture, they have this bonkers off the wall thing like, oh, well, we got to support homosexuality because after all, you know, we're Christians. That's an abomination, folks. That's a perversion of scripture when people do that. We look at them and we see them making decisions that will be in their own favor, but they're not wise decisions. They're decisions with very short range instead of looking down the future for the country and then looking farther down the future for eternity. So if you don't see any of that, that means three things. Number one, it means that there ought to be some Bible-believing Christians running for office. It's right and good according to the scripture. We find Joseph in high positions of government. We find Daniel in high positions of government. Others, folks, God doesn't condemn running for office in the political sphere. We pray for those in office. We pray for their salvation. Why not have some who are already saved and who have a foundation in the word of God getting into office? Maybe God has called you to do that. Maybe God will put it on your heart. Maybe you will remember this message and you won't be able to get away from it. We need Christian leaders. We need Christian leaders in the federal government for sure. We need Christian leaders in our state government. Not merely religionists, not merely people with good morals, not merely people who nod the head to God and then also bow to Mary. We need people who love the Christ of scriptures, not the Christ of cults. Oh, people, our country's in serious trouble. Christians ought to be running for office because it's right and good according to Scripture. Number two, Christians ought to be praying more fervently than they've ever prayed before for those who are already in office. Praying for their salvation. Praying for a courageous Christian walk. Praying for them to have divine wisdom. Praying for them to do right regardless of the cost. Why should we pray for them? Proverbs also tells us, Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And God moves his hand when God's people pray. That is so clear in scripture we can't get away from it. Why has not God moved the heart of our president into paths of righteousness? It is because God's people have not prayed. God is quite capable of turning his heart. How much time do you spend every day praying for President Obama, Vice President Biden? God can turn his heart. It says so. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. We can complain about all that's going on outside, but the real problem is on our insides. And number three, the third thing it tells us when we do not see the leadership that Scripture portrays as good, the third thing it tells us is that God would make our leaders avid students of Scripture, particularly the book of Proverbs. That's what we need to pray for them, folks. You know, it was David's wisdom that caused the people to love him. And it was David's wisdom that caused Saul, his political rival, to fear him. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 18. 
Verse 5, And David went out, whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. This is where he starts with, and Saul looks at it and thinks that's a good deal. And so Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. What we need to do is pray for leaders with wisdom. And you know, when they act wisely, and according to Scripture, God moves the hearts of people also. But then we find, just seven verses later, as Saul begins to understand the people are praising David, the women have come out to dance and say, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his ten thousands, and Saul was wroth. And then Saul begins to realize, this wise young man could be causing me some problems. And we get down to verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Too many Christians are ashamed to be public about their faith. Yes, you will get enemies like Saul. If you are public about your faith, and if people understand that the Lord is with you, they will be afraid of you and they will oppose you because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, took him out of his presence, made him captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. I'll just give him a you know, mid-range level uh, control of the army. I'll, I'll make him like a colonel. We'll put him down there. Uh, that should be nice. He'll only have influence over a smaller group of people. Well, be up here with me. But then it says... And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Do you get the point that the passage is making? Twice it's told us how wisely David behaved himself. Twice it's told us how the Lord was with him. And twice it tells us how much the people loved David. And verse 15 says, Wherefore then Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely. He was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. David wasn't afraid to be with the people. Interesting, he wasn't afraid of any assassination attempts. You know, we have all the special guards, the security guards, uh, around every place the president goes, and they, in advance, they check out all the places he's going to be. They check out all the food that's going to be served at every dinner. They make sure that the plates are shuffled and that everybody who goes to the dinner, you know, they don't know which one the, is the plate that's going to go in front of the president as those are brought out of the kitchen. I had a friend in the Secret Service a number of years ago and he was describing the incredible, immense amounts of protection that the president gets. It says, David went in and out among the people and they loved him. David was a wise man. The Lord was with him. David relied upon God's hand of protection. And that's what made Saul afraid, his political opponent. Yes, Proverbs 29, 12 gives us the next thing which we have to look for in a ruler. If a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. If a ruler hearkens to lies, all his servants are wicked. You have a man that lies, you have a man that believes lies, it tells you about the kind of people he's going to surround himself with. All his servants are wicked. This verse establishes for us that the bottom line for a ruler is his world view. World view is everything. World view is the lens that you see everything in life through. Is your worldview full of lies? Is it got lie at its foundation? You see, worldview is the filter that screens out what you see as bad versus what you see as good. Worldview will either be directed by the standards of the Bible or by some competing standards raised by the world, the flesh, the devil, or the demons. You know, there are Christians trying to stand on the world and on the Bible at the same time. They're trying to have a worldview where a 
out of one eye, they're seeing the world through the lens of the Bible, and out of the other eye, they're seeing the world through the lens of the world and the flesh and the devil. You know what that'll produce? Well, number one, it'll produce schizophrenia because it'll scramble your brain. It's like having the wrong lenses in your glasses. One lens is okay, the other lens is really distorted and weird and makes, you know, like those mirrors at the circus where the people are either real fat or real skinny or warped and twisted sideways like this. That'll do something to your brain. It will also do something to your brain physically. It will cause one eye to go blind. And whichever is the more powerful lens that the Christian has put on, that's the lens that will predominate until pretty soon the Christian is either seeing only the things from the Word of God but only seeing half of it, or seeing everything through the lens of the world. The world view, if a ruler hearkens to lies, he listens to the lies. Oh, you know about the big lies, the lies like evolution, for example. But if his foundation is, is comprised of a world view that is permeated with that which is false, what kind of leadership is he going to produce? He's going to surround himself with people who believe the same lies he does. And as that begins to spread throughout governmental authority, very soon those who believe differently will come under oppression. Proverbs 29.4 The king by judgment establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. Oh, uh, you've heard about the different scandals that have gone on in the last four years with different people who have taken bribes and so on. But that's what this is dealing with. This verse is dealing with the basis for decision making. What is the basis upon which a ruler makes his decisions? Will the leader be impartial and exercise righteous judgment? The king by judgment establisheth the land. Or will his judgment be based on his own personal self-interest, the obtaining of a bribe or other political favor? When you go to the polls to vote, look at a man's historic political record. You'll get his track record regardless of the promises that he made in his campaign. Proverbs 29.14 The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. Now don't understand that verse wrong. Too many people think, ah, oh, there it is, welfare. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor. The verse deals with respect of persons based on influence, position, and money. It's not dealing with the odd concept that a good ruler is one who increases the government largess, that is, handouts, to the lazy and indolent poor. Unfortunately, and we've seen that a lot in our country, that's what the wicked poor love. They love the government handouts paid for by the working citizens. This verse is instead dealing with giving equal judgment to the poor. And that includes not favoring them over the working citizens. Part of what equity is about. Part of what balance is about in the government. Paul says, if any will not work, neither shall he eat. Bottom line. We move to Proverbs 31. You all know that great passage. It's the proverb that deals with the godly woman in the last half of the chapter. Listen to what Solomon says about rulers in the first nine verses. We all know verses 10 through 31. But what does Solomon say about rulers in verses 1 through 9? The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So here's a king speaking. We presume it to be Solomon. What, my son, and what the son of my womb? And what the son of my vows? This would be Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the daughter of Ahithophel, David's counselor. He was never wrong on anything. A very wise man. And David committed adultery with his granddaughter and turned Ahithophel against him. And you know the rest of the story how Ahithophel wanted to kill David. And when it didn't happen, he hanged himself. Because he knew what would result. Bathsheba, the young woman who had been raised in a wise home. And she's the one giving the instructions here to her son. Give not thy strength unto women. Philandering kings, philandering presidents, philandering leaders at various levels of government 
Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Here's something leaders should pay attention to. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. The only one I can remember that never drank was Jimmy Carter. There may have been some other presidents in our history. But you know what the scripture says here? That's one of the ways that kings are destroyed. Oh, there are those who have, quote, been able to hold it. But wisdom says don't drink. By the way, you know we are a the kingdom of priests unto our God. We're made kings and priests unto our God. This applies to us. Don't drink. Alcohol is not for you if you're a believer. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What is going to control you? Some external force, such as wine, or the internal control of the Spirit of God, who causes the bearing of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Or will it be one too many drinks of wine, and you never know when that point will come, but even a little bit will control a little. A little bit may make you speak slurred a little bit. A lot will make you talk. And it will control your actions, you'll stagger. It will control your thoughts. Oh, Solomon talks about that, the seeing of the pink elephant kind of routine. Are you like somebody who's on a mass of a ship and wallowing in the sea and throwing up and when it's all over, you won't remember that they beat you, but you'll go after it again. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink, and now listen to this, and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Leaders have responsibilities. And part of it is making sure that we follow the law. And he's talking about God's law. The law is there for a purpose. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. We just sang it a few minutes ago. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Confirm thy liberty in law. Law is designed not merely to cramp your lifestyle, and that's how some people feel about the law, but law, and that includes rulers who scoff the law, it is to conform, confirm, to make established our liberty. The king by judgment establishes the land. The king that faithfully judges the poor. The king that doesn't drink, lest he forget the law of God and pervert the judgment of the afflicted. And then he goes on in verses 8 and 9, Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. You don't sit by silently and watch it happen if you're a king. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. You stand up for those who are defenseless, like the unborn like those who are in the latter years of their life and not able to make the decisions for themselves. Who do we have in politics? Oh, so few. That open their mouths and speak righteously for the cause of the needy. Those who cannot speak for themselves. Those verses deal with personal integrity, self-control versus external control, courage and righteous leadership, boldness and righteous speech, far-sighted wisdom, instead of this, only can see what's right in front of their face. Proverbs 12, 24 and 20, 25, 28. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Those verses deal with personal drive, with character, with diligence versus sloth. Our time is running out, so we're moving forward. Proverbs 31, 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Back to that Proverbs 31 passage. We can say a lot here, but we limit it. 
This verse is from the godly woman passage in Proverbs 31. A man's wife will have an immense influence over him. A man's wife is usually his closest confidant if he has a stable marriage. She can make him or break him. Her grace and her wisdom will either be an asset to him or their, her lack thereof will be a public reproach to him. A wise electorate, that's you and me, will carefully examine a man's marital relationship and the character of his wife. What kind of influence will she be on him and on his decision-making? Proverbs 20, verse 8, A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Proverbs 20, 26, A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. Proverbs 25, 5, Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. All three of those verses tell us how a godly ruler will deal with the wicked. Punishment and no toleration. Bring the wheel over them. Crush them. When you take them away, the throne of the righteous leader is established. On the other hand, the wise ruler will not be harsh, but he will be firm and equitable. Listen to Proverbs 20:28. 20, Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. Our time is up. So if you don't see those things, and many others that are in Proverbs and throughout Scripture, if you don't see those things in our leadership, remember, when you look at the political candidates and leaders, ask three questions. Do they have the fear of the Lord, salvation and godly lifestyle? Number two, do they make scripture their final touchstone for all of their decision making? Number three, are they wise? And if you don't see those things, it means you ought to be running for office or you ought to be praying for those in office and pray for them particularly that they will study the book of Proverbs and apply it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. It grieves us as we look at our nation and at the politicians. Oh, how few statesmen we have. We have lots of politicians, but very few statesmen. And particularly very few Christian statesmen, those who function on the basis of godly principle. Those who make the scripture their final touchstone those who search the scriptures daily to find out how they apply to the very difficult decisions that they make, how they need subtlety and discretion when they come to the so-called gray areas where the waters have been clouded by many different eloquent but wrong-thoughted speeches by people who have twisted the truth Father, we pray that you will save our leaders. We pray that you will give them godly lifestyles based on the scripture. We pray, Father, that you will give them wisdom, which comes only from your word as it is illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God. It will be holy wisdom, not merely political acumen. Father, we pray for our leaders. We pray for the candidates in office now that are running for various positions across this land. We pray for them, Father. We pray that you will save each one of them in their campaign trails, cause them to come across Christians who will be unashamed in sharing the gospel of Christ and pointing to the truth of your word. Take your word and use it, Father. Draw them to yourself. Cause them to be saved and then to have a very quick crash course in spiritual growth that they might apply themselves in this coming series of years while they're in office. Oh, Father, for the good of your people, for the testimony of Jesus Christ, for the glory of the one who loved us and bought us with his own blood, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.